Paul Mamek. I'm the CEO of uh, Kirusa. And uh, thanks, Tim, for the uh, uh, for the introductions. And uh, uh, before I start, I'll just mention, give a little bit brief of what we do uh, at Kirusa. We are a company that takes a, a very holistic 360 degree view on different types of services to enable rich business messaging. Uh, we build chatbots, we build a directory that enables discovery of chatbots. We provide APIs for aggregation, for RCS, for, what, for WhatsApp, and also for Google business messaging. We also work with several carriers to manage the RBM services, including onboarding, verification, payments. And we do this sometimes at the carrier level, and we're also doing it at the country level for multiple carriers in the country. Coming to the topic of today's discussion, um, first, what is P2A messaging? I think P2A messaging has been a theme that has been pervasive through several sessions in this conference. Um, but just to kind of summarize, it's messaging that is initiated by the consumer, by the user, when they send a message to a brand's application. It can be a, it can be a result of the consumer searching for the brand, finding a, a presence on a messaging platform and then messaging them or the user hears about it through an advertising campaign of the brand or gets an A2P message and then responds to it, or maybe gets a call to action from a different channel like a newspaper or a web ad or, a, a, or an SMS. Or maybe he has had past interaction with a brand and he, so he has that uh, chat resident in his messages app and can uh, send a message from there. Very broadly speaking, there are two major types of use cases for uh, P2A messaging. One is consumers want to get support from a live agent. And so that's a live agent support. And the second is that there is uh, an automated um, experience could be for customer interaction, information, services to be got, entertainment, uh, usually powered by AI, NLP, uh, to an automated experience. Now, these sometimes these two kind of gel together and meld together because a, an automated experience can be followed by a live agent support. And if somebody builds a live agent support over time, they can add an automated experience as well. There are several messaging uh, platforms on which P2A messaging is uh, popular or, or being proposed. Uh, four of the major ones are WhatsApp, um, RCS, uh, Google Business uh, Messaging, and Apple Business Chat. P2A messaging is used for many purposes. Brands use it for support to engage the existing customers, get new customers, just improve the customer experience, get opt-ins. There are several reasons why P2A messaging can be used. Here are some examples I'll kind of flash by just to put some real world cases, use cases on it. Uh, Nine Mobile, um, in fact, Bola, who's a panelist, um, she, they built, uh, was used to work at Nine Mobile and they built a chatbot to provide customer care. So you could buy data, um, check your balances all from a automated chatbot. Vodafone has uh, built an agent over WhatsApp where you can get live agent support over WhatsApp. Uh, Levi's has built a chatbot over Google business messaging. So if you want to go to any store uh, in say New York, you can um, uh, click uh, the messages icon in the maps app and get live agent support or get automated support. TD Ameritrade, which is a bank in, uh, um, in North America, uh, has uh, built a whole experience over Apple business chat. Again, either live agent or automated responses. One of our panelists today is uh, uh, the CEO of Abi, and they've built an entire experience over WhatsApp and other uh, messages apps as well to get um, their uh, provide health service over a WhatsApp bot.
the P2A traffic is expected to explode. Uh, it is uh, to over 200 billion messages, just over RCS and many more over the other channel, if you count all the channels. Since we to, in this session are going to focus on RCS, have the RCS number, over $15 billion in revenue. So to grow this, to get this traffic, what do we have to do? How do the user actually interact? So the first problem really is how does the user find a bot? And that's the problem of discovery. How to discover a bot? How do I know what the bot does? Is that bot interesting to me? If it is, how do I initiate a chat with the bot? To do discovery, a common mode is directories. How do I search an RCS bot that are available to me? And there are three ways of doing that search. I'll talk about that in a minute. Or for the brand to do marketing. Uh, one is user driven, one is a brand driven of how the user can find out about the bot. Once the user finds out about the bot, there's also the problem of how do I actually start a chat? How do I initiate a conversation? And again, several models are, are available. Uh, there can be a button that you click on a button in a directory and you can then start chatting with the bot. Uh, there can be a button on the website you click and you start chatting with the bot. You can scan a QR code and the minute you scan a QR code, uh, you can get into a WhatsApp or you can get into an RCS uh, chat with the, with the brand. Or you can make a phone call and uh, in response to a phone call, you get, a, you get the bot um, conversation started in your messages app. Or in some markets where USSD is popular, um, you could dial a USSD code for a bot interaction. These are all the triggers that are available. To give you some examples of directories, um, uh, you, and here's a directory that you can actually search for from the web. It's, a, it's called .go.com. Uh, my company, Kirusa, makes this. And uh, anybody who has a bot can go in and list their, that their WhatsApp bots or RCS bots into this directory. But again, several operators also work with us to automatically list all their RCS bots into this, into this directory. Another way to search a directory is actually from a, a chatbot of chatbots. So right from your messages app, you can, um, you can have a chatbot that provides you the search functionality to search for chatbots. And uh, again, several carriers use that. Some carriers are building it. We are building this. We have actually built and launched .co bot store. And it is a, available as a default directory chatbot for several operators. Another way to search for directories is um, through a built-in search function in the messages app itself. Some messages app like Samsung messages support built-in uh, um, search, uh, which is what the screenshots show. Also one of our panelists, Gavin is from Witch Software and they have a client and it also includes built-in search for all the bots. And the screenshot shown on the right of the slide is a uh, uh, from the WIT client working in Japan and showing various chatbots in the Japanese market. Uh, the one on the left is uh, working on with the Mavenir platform with T-Mobile. So that's a search in T-Mobile that's a, on the left and the search in uh, KDDI on the, on the right. Uh, we, have, uh, we have worked on a white paper for um, uh, on RCS directories, we've done a lot of study and search uh, for what directories are available, what capabilities they have. And we expect to launch this uh, um, white paper next week. It will be available uh, on the MEF website, but if you would like to get it, please you can email or um, message us on the chat and we'll be sure to send you a copy of this directory white paper as soon as it's available. We've compared the capabilities of several directories like Orange, Orange is building directories, Vodafone has built and launched directories, Synchronous has directories. Uh, we have a directory .go, which some carriers like Nine Mobile have already announced and launched as well. AT&T has directories as well. 
One last thing I'll also talk about uh, regarding P2A messaging that's very important is pricing. How do, you, how do brands pay for it? How do consumers pay for it? Generally speaking for consumers, it is free, except for the data that might come and back, come, uh, go back and forth between the consumer on their app. But there's a wide variation in the pricing models that are used between RCS and WhatsApp and Google business messaging and Apple business chat. Uh, in RCS, the pricing depends upon the operator. Some operators have priced uh, P2A to, as totally free, whereas some of them have priced as much as five times the cost of an SMS. Um, on the other hand, in the case of WhatsApp and Apple business chat and Google business chat, the P2A messages are free. Uh, some of them don't even allow A2P, some of them charge for A2P. But all of them have some model of a, a water P2 conversation and it's free. That's it, back to you, Tim. Brilliant, thank you, Indipal. Um, it's a great overview. Um, obviously, Indipal focused quite um, heavily in his presentation on the question of search and discovery, which um, can't really overestimate how important that's gonna be, especially <clears throat> if, um, if messaging does um, fulfill our expectations and uh, it's going to, you know, the directory function is going to be as important as the Google search box and the uh, app store search function. So it's uh, an interesting topic, which is why um, we have decided for our poll for this session that we're going to ask you, the audience, about where you think you will search uh, for bots from a brand, um, from the web, from a chatbot of chatbots, from search built into clients or from all of the above, depending on the situation. So uh, if you go to the poll um, poll listing on the right of your screen, um, that should be coming up soon. And it'd be great if you could answer that while we're having a chat and we'll come back to those answers at the end. Um, so obviously a lot to get through. I wanted to start actually, um, before we sort of dig into uh, bots and directories and so on, I wanted to uh, bring in Kim Frederick, um, he is running a service which um, starts, uh, it's based around um, incoming conversa conversation from um, individuals. So he's got a, an insight into just how willing people are to start these conversations. So Kim Frederick, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about Abbey Health and what you've learned about the way that um, customers are willing to start these conversations. Thanks, Tim. Um, so at, at, at Abbey Global Health, uh, we, we uh, provide a service which is a medical micro consultation service. So it allows people to get uh, fast answers from a doctor, but the interaction is mediated by a chatbot, uh, which allows us to deliver that service, um, as Indrapal mentioned, inside of WhatsApp or SMS, Telegram, Viber, uh, you, name, you name the chat app and we're in there. And, and this is a real, it's a, it's a bit of a double challenge for us because uh, health is a topic that people are normally not excited to engage in unless they actually have a health question. Uh, so that's one issue that we have to face. And then the other one is this question of discovery generally. Now, now we usually work uh, B2B2C, so we get help on the discovery side from our clients. But what we've found uh, to work is, is really a, a whole range of answers instead of just one solution. So we try to create an experience which, which has as low a barrier to entry as possible, and then to be wherever someone happens to be when they have a question about their health. So we use everything from uh, posters with a QR code on it in refugee camps in Greece, uh, to uh, SMSs that come from us with a deep link that opens the chat, uh, opens the chatbot immediately in, let's say, WhatsApp, um, or people can send a keyword to a phone number to to create an account. We have a secondary issue, which is actually logging into the service because once you're chatting with a chatbot, you then need to uh, uh, prove that you have the right credentials to log into the service. So that is a sort of secondary issue. Some uh, chatbots work better on that, or sorry, some uh, platforms work better on that than others. Uh, but again, we find that there is really no one solution and it's really about having a range of options that people can access the service in many different ways, depending upon their particular circumstance. So these, these individuals are asking questions of doctors. How do you route their 
questions to the right doctor. So we're using natural language processing to build a profile of the question. And then we have a distributed network of doctors who are available 24 seven and we're using machine learning algorithms to uh, prioritize the doctors based on the question because we know how well they've answered previous questions. We know what their expertise is. So we're matching them that way. Um, and then you take, that takes about 30 seconds, three minutes later, they'll get an answer from the doctor. So it's, it's what we call live Q and A or a micro consultation. And these are always to human doctors, they're not to bots. Always human doctors, yeah. Again, you know, it's very important in the health space to actually have an impact. Uh, in our experience um, and in the assessment of people like the uh, British Medical Journal, systems that are only uh, chatbots don't really change user behavior. There's something about an answer from a real doctor. So Interpol was talking about this as well, the sort of interface between humans and chatbots. And, and in our particular circumstance, uh, there's always a human and there's always a chatbot in every interaction. Uh, but the medical answer always comes from a real doctor. Yeah. So we'll come back onto the kind of interaction between AI and um, and bots and, you know, uh, mediating uh, the balance between them. Um, Bola, I wonder if I could come to you. Um, can you give us an insight into um, how this P2A uh, and chatbot uh, revolution is, is impacting um, in Africa so far? Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I, I think it's quite early days, to be honest, right? So uh, the brands are sort of all, you know, they've heard of this thing. Everyone is asking questions, but actually, I, I think people are sort of just waiting to see, right? And waiting to see who the first guinea pig, so to speak, will be, right? And so, I, I mean, when I was on iMobile, we thought very strongly about being able to put, you know, just show or demonstrate uh, what this would look like, how the interactions would be. Etc., which is why we then launched two bots, right? And that's been quite, you know, quite a useful tool in not only showing brands exactly how, you know, because it, it you know, to, to a lot of them, it's still very technical, very early days, right? Especially with RCS. I mean, on the WhatsApp end, it's that, that's a different kettle of fish, right? But, we, you know, I, I guess in the RCS space, they're still waiting to see. There's also the, you know, the issue of reach and how many people are on this thing yet. So I guess a lot of people are taking a tentative view, sort of wait and, you know, wait and see what will happen. But I mean, we think it will happen. I think, you know, Africa particularly is a very, very ripe market for this because of not only the whole idea of handsets and, the, you know, this kind of space issues that they have. In principle, this should work quite well. So I think it's a wait and see approach, but, you know, we're quite keen to sort of demonstrate examples and show what's possible. What kind of use cases can you see um, so, really exploding in your markets? Uh, so I, I think customer care will be the biggest one because it's a natural extension of, of what's happening. And if you look at a lot of the guys in this space, they're already delivering A to P services across all the channels anyway. And so to our mind, it's an incremental uh, addition as opposed to revolution, right? And yeah, I think everyone's quite excited for what, you know, what is possible. But I think the sense I'm getting from a lot of the bigger brands is that they, you know, they, there's a fear of missing out. And so if you know, only initially it's just to be, you know, to join into, you know, all of this really, you know, exciting talk that's going on. I think there's a sense that people want to try things out. Now, I expect that the bots will get more and more complicated over time, but people are just keeping the use cases very simple, you know, at this stage, you know, and so for, you know, with Nightmobile, for example, I think Indipa mentioned this, very simple use case, like let, let me buy data, let me check my balance, let me, you know, interact with, you know, you know with an agent, very, you know, very, very basic stuff at this stage. And what, what, um, which platforms would they be, would those uh, services be rolled out on? Is it what, is it a big WhatsApp market where you are or? Uh, well, I mean, you know, I, I want to, you know, I wouldn't talk much about WhatsApp. I'm, you know, referring specifically to RCS and, and our, mm. RCS business messaging, right? Mm. And I think in the WhatsApp conversation is happening as well. It's happening independently, perhaps, you know, uh, you know, at a different pace. But, you know, in the RCS, you know, in the RCS space, Nine Mobile is live, right? Another operator is about to go live and we expect the you know, majority of the market to be, you know, live you know, by the end of this year, early next year. So there's quite a, a sense of palpable excitement. You know, people are quite excited to see what will happen. And I think Nigeria, particularly or Africa, is actually going to be a pretty good market, uh, you know, for RCS and our, you know, RCS business messaging. Let's, you know, let's see, let's see how it goes. 
Okay, so Rashma, let's uh, turn to you because um, Indipal did mention uh, Orange's activities in this space. Can you summarise where you're at with it and what you've learned so far? Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm leading product delivery uh, for European market and also for the African market across our footprint, all RCS business messaging services. So um, my focus is really to see how we can enrich this channel by bringing in key value services like discovery, which is very, very important and crucial as we onboard brand on our channel. Um, and also to see, uh, as uh, Apollo was saying, so to, to uh, discovery can lead to more services. So it can, it can lead to a full end-to-end uh, -end experience for customers. Uh, so we need to provide some sort of payments integration and identity integration. So all of this is sort of key services that we need to put in place. Um, at, at Orange, uh, we are now implementing a chatbot directory um, and uh, we, uh, we have rolled out RCS in 20 markets. We are la launching bots. So at the moment, the main use cases are all uh, around direct marketing and also some sort of um, a tutorial RCS welcome bot tutorial kind of bots. Uh, but we are also trialing uh, some of the content bots. So, for example, the Orange Celebrity bot in um, Africa, and uh, it, it has been developed by Kirusa. And uh, so we, we are seeing a lot happening. So it's, it's been a bit slow, 2020, but 2021, we will see more bots coming on board. And this means uh, we need to provide some sort of a channel in which our consumers can discover the bots. And therefore, uh, we think directory is one, one important channel um, because our consumers are there inside the messaging experience and it's from there they can discover bots, they can start engaging right away. They don't have to leave the messaging channel. But also, um, I echo what um, Kim was saying about it's not just about enabling directory. That's not just one channel. Uh, as brands, you need to open up this discovery experience across every, every, every other channel. So it has to be kind of organic. It, you have to be there where your customers are there and you open up the channel. And then we as operators and, um, and uh, service providers, we need to make sure that we are connected. We open up and uh, enable the communication from whatever discovery model it is so that our uh, consumers um, can really find, engage with the bots. So um, it's, it's really exciting. And um, I believe in uh, P2A being becoming bigger uh, as we move along in 2021, we see more bots and uh, therefore directory is, is definitely one of the key discovery models. It's, it's there, it, it uh, gives opportunities for us as MNOs where we can think there are some new revenue models that we can come up. And, and also for brands, it's a brand new uh, area. They, they can really engage uh, with customers. They can get more leads and um, onboard more people. So I think it's, it's really interesting for us. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the revenue opportunity. We're certainly going to come back to that. Um, I'd like to turn to Gavin now, because um, you're um, you're sort of uh, a, a bit like uh, Garusa. You're sort of in the back end of all this. Um, can you summarise um, what you've you know s seen from the MNOs um, in terms of how they've rolled these services out, how they're thinking about um, marketing them to customers and so on? Yeah. So. Um, WIT uh, is a technology provider and we're providing uh, the RCS, core RCS platform and the map gateway um, to some of the world's biggest and most innovative customers. Um, what for one, for example, is the three Japanese carriers. So they've all launched RCS. They're, um, they're using the WIT map platform to deliver um, uh, RCS business messaging to their customers. They decided that they would start off with a P2A model. So rather than using that platform to replicate the old world of SMS A2P, where you send out millions of RCS messages, uh, of SMS messages. They wanted to put a, a selection of, uh, of chatbots available and allow their discover uh, their consumers to organically discover those and start to interact with those. So that was a conscious decision from their point to start off. And I think that's uh, proven uh, successful for those guys. We have, uh, we have other customers uh, um, who are looking to deliver chatbots 
uh, as part of their RCS and deliver those chatbots through, through RCS. Of course, chatbots are discoverable via a, a whole range of different channels. So we have customers who are discovering chatbots uh, through QR codes and through deep links. They're discovering chatbots through an SMS as, a, as an initial trigger. We have uh, people who are using uh, IVR redirect. So as people, somebody calls the IVR, they can be redirected to a chatbot. Um, there's a whole range of, of course, you know, the chatbots that WIP provides via our um, uh, chatbot platform are also available in other channels like WhatsApp and Facebook and uh, the, uh, other, uh, and SMS even. So our, uh, we firmly believe that uh, chatbots are fundamental. Uh, you know, a P2A engagement between a consumer and a brand is of the most value. That's the end point that we should be aiming for. And the, paper, the way people should discover those chatbots should be not constrained too much by the old, you know, it has to be in that RCS uh, messaging channel. Um, and, and SMS is a great place where, where uh, people can, you know, for mobile operators, that they can monetize your chatbots. You can now have, in effect, a chatbot conversation over SMS, um, which I think is a, a great uh, potential value for mobile operators. As and, well as what, uh, and what about the response from brands and from end users? Are they enthusiastically adopting these well, services where they're available or do they, are they being marketed to and so on? We, we see uh, we see our, our operator customers. So we our, our customers are our operators. We see the enterprises banging on the door of those operators to say, we've seen this use cases that you can achieve with an RCS chatbot. RCS, we believe, is the richest environment. It's richer than WhatsApp and Facebook. You know, because you have the idea of carousels, rich cards, suggested actions. When you combine that with natural language understanding uh, and some other AI that we have in the back end, you, you, through RCS, you can create this fantastically rich user experience. Um, at, and it's just a question of getting the RCS channel out there. You know, so those, enterpri those enterprises really want to use that channel. Um, and the uh, operators just have to get it out there and make it available. Um, that's the big question, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> it is. <laughs> and um, I mean, dare I even ask about what you think Apple will do in, in the RCS space? Well, <laughs> Um, I think uh, ultimately, you know, we know that um, a lot of operators have been banging on Apple's door and we know that there's a momentum building. So I would like to think that uh, uh, at some point in time, Apple will, uh, it'll be in their interest to join the, the kind of ecosystem and, and, and enable RCS as a channel. Mm. But when that will happen, I have no crystal ball on that. Uh, and of course, there are other things going on within the ecosystem which uh, may impact that decision to bring it closer or or push it further away. Okay, so back to Indepal. Um, you, you talked about the different um, options available for discovery and also for starting conversations with bots. What's your sense of uh, where the, which are the most popular are at the moment? I'm going to answer that question, but uh, let me also briefly comment upon your prior question about yeah. Apple as well. Um, uh, I, th I think uh, what has happened over the last three to four months is Google has shown a way of coexisting Google business messaging with RCS. So we are focused very heavily on Google business messaging, which is kind of like ABC, while, con while supporting RCS in their, in their messages app. And I hope that that also provides a formula for Apple as they are heavily invested into ABC, that they can also use RCS as the um, core part of the, their iMessage app as well. Uh, coming to your question about how people are actually uh, connecting to, uh, we, we started a directory effort uh, where we put RCS and WhatsApp bots in there. And uh, some of the, uh, we've launched that with one in partnership with uh, one operator who's already announced it. And there are more that are in the, in, in the process where all the bots are being entered. But what we see from a WhatsApp perspective that QR codes have become QR codes and buttons on the on the web to connect, uh, both of which link to the have the same URL link, has become a very common trigger point. So, uh, if you if you take this notion that people are doing search and uh, they search on the web and they come to a button or a QR code, and they can hold their phone to the QR code, or they can just click on the button from the phone itself, and uh, the minute they click on it it jumps to their WhatsApp app or it jumps to their RCS app that we see as a very powerful model to make it uh, happen and applicable universally um, wherever you are 
um, whether you are searching on your PC or whether you are searching on your on your mobile mobile phone. It does require that the channel support what I will call a trigger link, and the bot support a trigger link. This comes as default in WhatsApp, but it is not really a default in RCS. And that's one of the challenges we have found as we have uh, started building out this directory of, of RCS bot at the first trigger URL, okay, to which a QR code links or to which uh, um, a web button links, um, the bot developer has to create that URL and some of them don't because they're not aware of this model. So when a bot developer comes and tries to enter their um, um, their bot on our directory, if it's a WhatsApp bot, they give a number and we can generate the URL automatically. But if it's an RCS bot, they need to actually do something on their bot site to develop that link as well. Okay. Um, Kim, Frederick, I want to come back to you. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, discovery of, of of um of bots and um how customers start these conversations i wonder if you could tell us a little bit more from uh from your point of view exactly how customers are using these um tools because one of the elements of of the new messaging tools is that they're rich media so you can do more than texting so are you finding that uh, on your channel people are sending over images and and um and doing more than just um short text conversations yeah, absolutely. I mean, as you can imagine, uh, when it comes to health questions, very often an image is involved. That could be uh, people asking for help interpreting the results of a medical test. Um, you know, the the classic one would be, I've got, I've got two tubes here. Which one was the right cream to use? I've forgotten that sort of thing. <laughs> or you know, a picture of a rash. Or uh, uh, you know, it, it is is there quite a wide variety. Um, we we that we know we support that as part of the process where it's possible. So again, I mentioned that our service is available by SMS, uh, so we, we can't do images through that channel. Um, but I think you know we're we're really excited about some of the developments uh, in this space because of the ability to add uh, more media, more interactions, more possibilities to that kind of micro consultation. Um, you know, we're not trying to replace uh, an in-person visit uh, if that's necessary, but there's a lot of uh, cases where people need to know if they, you know, the, the, the question they really have is, do I need to go to a doctor at all? And the, the richer that question is, or the more information they can provide in that question, the easier it is to answer that question for, for uh, our doctors. Um, but yeah, images, I would say, probably something like 20% of the cases, maybe 25% of the cases that we handle involve uh, an image as well. Um, we, we need to get onto the question of business models and, and revenue. So how, how do you monetize um, the kind of P2A messaging service that you're running? Yeah, so I think this is a really good question. And you know, in a lot of the discussion uh, that's, that's going on at the moment, th there is this question of, why is a consumer going to use it and who's going to pay for it, right? Uh, so it's nice that there's a great channel, but why should someone go down that path if there's not value? And I think a, a chatbot in and of itself is not interested. The chatbot actually has to do something for the, for the consumer. Um, so, you know, we really focus on that. How do, we, how do we maximize the value that someone's getting out of the chatbot? And then on the, uh, on the, on the business model question, we feel quite strongly that we've taken the right approach with B2B2C. So insurance companies pay for the service for their members. We actually uh, work with governments as well. We're about to launch a project with uh, a, a Spanish regional health authority uh, providing our service to um, young people in schools. Uh, and the, the, you know, that um, it, it, our view is that a paywall is just another barrier to use. It's just another barrier to entry. So we can remove that paywall by having healthcare payers pay for the service, all the better. And I think that, um, you know, everyone else in the space needs to consider that as well. Uh, you know, how can we build, if a consumer is going to pay, how can we build a, bill, a billing model, which is as low barrier as possible? Whether that's, uh, you know, we've looked at things like direct carry billing. We do have a direct-to-consumer option as well. 
but it, the question is always how do you reduce that barrier to entry by making you know making uh, uh, that step as smooth as possible okay so let's stick with um revenue models uh Reshma, to come back to you uh you kind of flag this up in your first answer do, is there an opportunity for mnos to um to monetize these directories um in the same way that you know google has monetized its search results yeah um certainly there are many many options um there's um there's a lot of discussion around this topic. There's no one fixed solution or an answer, uh, but there are uh, several opportunities. So um, starting with directories, um, there's definitely some potential there uh, to monetize because, um, as I said, it offers a, sort of a brand new area for brands to uh, put their bots. So MNOs giving that channel to brands um, can think about some monetization opportunities. So brands will be willing to pay to um, to be discoverable and also to uh, to be sponsored or to be promoted in the um, MNO directory. So there's definitely a, a potential model there. And um, and certainly there's a big question around, um, it's, it's free for customers, but do they even think of um, paying something to access some premium content? Um, it's, it's still out there. There's no conclusive answers for that. Uh, but um, other than the directory services, um, today we already have some standard ways of discovery. So sending an SMS to a short code um, URL, clicking on a URL or QR codes and stuff. But um, if we want to move those kind of discovery models into RCS, then as Indrapal was saying, it's not, uh, it's not very clear. The deep links or the trigger links are, uh, are not available. So that needs to be built. Um, so potentially uh, there could be um, some way in which the uh, trigger or the access to such discovery models can think, of, then we can think about monetizing their charging, uh, charging brands to enable the existing capabilities and moving them onto RCS channel. Um, then there's um, also with P2A discovery, um, you will onboard more bots, it will generate more traffic. So again, you're um, seeing, you will see a lot of footfall into the channel. So there's uh, definitely some monetization opportunities there. Um, as we know, uh, some sort of single message or a conversational um, model but um, I think I think the biggest um, opportunity I see is where we can um, do a complete end-to-end -end kind of an integration. So as I said, like you know, you the consumer starts off, discovers the bot, and then they go all the way through to finishing and uh, finishing and closing the the. Uh, um, uh, the transaction. So I think that is the biggest benefit and it's seamless, it should be seamless um, experience for our consumers. So as um, Kim Frederick was saying that, you know, if we can do carrier billing, carrier billing is one really strong um, asset that we have as operators. It offers seamless experience, can be integrated easily uh, into the uh, chatbots channel. So we can certainly see some sort of monetization opportunities, some more additional revenues coming from this channel uh, of payments. And uh, it's, it's over and about what we can make with RCS uh, monetization. So definitely there are many, many opportunities. Uh, we have to see work on a use case per use case basis and uh, see what works for uh, our uh, countries. Bola, is, um, is, is carrier billing um, and in integrating payments inside a chat session something that you're looking at in a, in a mobile first market like yours? Absolutely. I think it's a, you know, it's a, we see it as an area of huge potential, right? So to be able to close that loop as restaurant, you know, and, and complete the whole process, we think that's something that's definitely on the plan. Now, we're also looking at integrating other payment methods outside of carrier billing, right? So something like mobile money, for example, or, you know, payment wallets, because that gives, a, because it's cash, that gives a wider scope of, you know, in a prepaid market like Nigeria, for example, that gives a wider a scope of uh, what's possible. I, I think an important question though, that I probably haven't you know, heard talked about, I think it's important that we mention it, is in markets where there are multiple players, 
in the space, right? Who takes the responsibility for actually managing that discovery function? Who takes the responsibility for managing verification, you know, functions, et cetera, et cetera? Because in a, in a case where it's, in, you know, it's situated in each individual carrier, our view at Nine Mobile was to say, well, have an independent party sort of run that service. Uh, and so when you have multiple players in that ecosystem, you, start to, you have to start thinking about how the monetization works, right? Because who's gonna pay for it? Who's gonna ensure integrity? Who's gonna ensure that the governance is followed through you know, thoroughly across, and the same standards are applied across all the different operators. And so from our point of view, we thought it was important that there is the role of an independent player who can almost be an arbiter right to, you know to manage the process end to end uh, I, I thought it was important to sort of add that in so who is that independent player well in our case i guess we 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 you know chose to go with curiosa uh, mm -hmm. because we i guess we we found them quite supportive and quite helpful in the whole process you know you know getting off by you know I guess it's not clear if the, all the other operators in the market will go with them, but from our point, our hope is that we can have one central person who manages this from a local point of view. Because remember, we want to avoid a lot of the mistakes that we made with ATP in the SMS space. Okay, so in the part, I'll come back to you on that. Is that um, do you see that a company like Caruso should be uh, that's that's a role for you going forward? And I think you need to unmute. Well, uh, you know, the making sure that the bots that are being launched are authentic, are verified, that the brands are verified, they have a check mark, is a very critical function of the whole business messaging um, paradigm. And that's a big change from the way things have been working in SMS to the way they're going to work in business messaging. Uh, WhatsApp has their own verification process. Apple has their own verification process and they are pretty detailed. Uh, for RCS, the verification has to be done by the, by the operators. And it is an undue burden on the, on the brands if in one market, let's take an example of a Nigeria or a Germany, you know, typically a market will have four operators, or maybe one more or one less, but for a brand to get, go through the same verification process incur that's the cost of the medical process four times just to be able to launch a bot. Um, so we, we think it is very uh, important that they have a, there be a process for the countries so that, and for the brands and for the sake of the operators and the sake of the ecosystem, that one entity is able to verify them and then the verification holds in all of the in all of the operators. That verification also makes sure that entries we made into directory are authentic. The data is, um, can be trusted, it's high quality. Now there are several models and I know MEF is doing a big, uh, big push in this whole verification area. But we do, from our perspective, we have taken on that role in certain countries. Um, so we are doing a verification either at a carrier level, like uh, Bola just mentioned, but also at a country level uh, and again, we are working with several of the other operators in uh, in Nigeria and in a couple of other countries as well, <clears throat> as a look at this this whole problem. In the U.S., um, the carriers have already realized this, and they have uh, <clears throat> formed the initiative CCMI to do a common uh, onboarding and verification. So, uh, as we kind of look at our uh, processes, we don't build a map like WIT software builds a map. And that's a very important function. Google builds a map, we do not. But we provide a layer which uh, kind of can facilitate a common onboarding, a common uh, verification, and uh, uh, common rules and policies for the, for the country. And then uh, we would also fully support the process of inter-communication between different verification agencies as a model that MEF and we as a part of that are also working, uh, working towards. Okay, well, um, that's a good answer because we, we've been having some um, some questions from the audience, and and one asked about verification, so um, and authentication. So that was good that you got onto that. Um, I'm going to come back to Gavin. So, um, uh, what's the reality of a uh, for a brand if they want to list on multiple different directories in mul with multiple different operators? 
uh, maybe in different channels as well. Um, yeah, how, 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 how uh, di difficult is that process and do you see it getting easier? Okay, so it, it's, uh, it's probably not an easy process at this point in time. If we take uh, the, again the example of, uh, of in Japan, you have three separate services from three separate carriers. Um, we allow the uh, directory, uh, the search across directories to be federated. So if a, if a, a, a KDDI user is searching for a chatbot, that search can be federated across the others. And that search will turn up the result as long as the operators are in agreement. You know, the operators are always in control of that. Uh, and of course, there are, we also provide synchronization across these different directories as well. But that is in, in the context of one country, one domain, where there is close collaborative collaboration between the operators. So uh, the mechanism works, it's working in a commercial world, but it, it ha has to be done without close collaboration. For that to be universally available across the whole world, you know, is, is, some, is some step away. If you take the example that uh, uh, Endopal mentioned about the CCMI, you know, they're approaching it by having a centralized directory in the US for all four carriers. The CCMI is a joint venture from all four US carriers. And, and in effect, they're centralizing that. So all uh, subscribers of all um, of the uh, US uh, carriers will be able to search, a, in effect, a single centralized directory. So two approaches to the problem, um, uh, but not universal across all markets and all channels. You think we'll start to see um, directories uh, with different um, custodians, as it were. So. Will, will Samsung control the directory and will a user on a Samsung device be able to go to the Samsung directory or the directory of uh, the operator or will there be some kind of independent specialist chatbot company who start a chatbot of chatbots? How, how do you see the kind of um, the multiplicity, multiplicity of choices being? I think, I think it'll emerge market by market. As I said, in, in, in the US with CCMI, that whole um, idea of uh, directory is, is sorted. You know, the, the device OEMs are cooperating and participating as per the GSMA specifications. So I think we heard earlier, as long as everybody sticks to the GS, GSMA specifications, there is these inbuilt mechanisms are there. Um, the idea of a, of, a, um, of a concierge chatbot, a chatbot that can help you find things, I think will emerge. We're already working on such concepts. Um, and that, uh, that chatbot has the ability to potentially work across different channels and different, um, but that's not a concept that is here uh, today uh, and, in, and in a commercial uh, or um, production situation, but certainly the concept will emerge, I'm sure. Reshma, how, how do you, how would you feel, Orange, about um, several different chatbot directories being available alongside your own uh, to your customers? Um, I I think that's going to be the reality. Um, there'll be multiple chatbots, um, MNO chatbots, third party independent directories. Um, um, but I think um, what's important and what we have seen um, is successful, at least um, in uh, the Japanese market and uh, potentially in the US, that's going to come is um, sort of um, a, a close collaboration between the operators. Um, and uh, sort of availability of um, interconnection and federation across these directories, because I, I think that is that is the key thing. We can't sort of restrict and keep it uh, closed. It should be uh, kind of discoverable. It should be uh, made easy for uh, a subscriber. So an orange subscriber in Spain should be able to discover what's available on uh, the Vodafone chatbot directory. And um, uh, potentially, if I find uh, the, uh, the bot, uh, I can share it with my contact who is on Vodafone Network. So it sort of uh, helps to spread the reach. Um, and um, I, think, I think it's important. Therefore, we believe in that. Uh, we are not there at the moment to, uh, to go um, and uh, do some sort of um, directory to directory federation. But that is our vision. That is our vision moving forward. Um, Bola, who, whose job is it to market the um, the existence of chatbots to to customers, or, or should they just discover them organically? 
It's a great question, actually, Tim. I think it's a mix, right? I think it's a mix. I think, uh, and a part of this actually come with the monetization opportunities. I think the more people get involved, the more there will be, uh, uh, you know, brands be primarily responsible for making the chatbots, you know, you know, available. But I think initially the MNO is taking, you know, will have to take a front, you know, front foot and sort of support. But I, I, I suspect that as the market gets more and more mature, brands will have to sort of prioritize discover you know discoverability really um as part of the you know marketing initiatives because at the end of the day it's in their interest right so, you know it's also a much cheaper uh, channel so to speak and so you know to my mind naturally they'll be responsible for making sure that customers know that their bots exist uh you know and can use them regularly in the pal um to come back to you um how much of a uh uh, disconnect do you think there might be between the different channels in terms of how you discover bots? So we had um, uh, yesterday uh, conversations with Google and about, and not with Apple, but about Apple. And uh, they're rolling out their services, which are very much um, give the give the customers option to discover these uh, op opportunities to, to converse in search results, even in maps and so on. So there's a very different way of discovering them proactively looking on a chatbot directory and so on. So do you think there'll be big differences between how the channels, different channels handle discoverability? I think if you look at, look at it from the perspective of a consumer, uh, they do searches in many different ways. Okay? There is no single way that users search. So if you are in a maps app and you are looking to go to a business, you are searching for the business already in the maps app. So it's a great uh, initiative by Google to say, well, right where you are searching for the, for the maps, now I put in a, a link to do a message. And, uh, and that's the kind of the, the thesis behind Google, Google business messaging. So the way they say it, you don't need to kind of search for it inside the uh, a messaging directory because uh, um, because it is part of your search for a maps, and I think this will coexist. Uh, the the maps uh, kind of a search is more relevant for a store. If I'm going to a Levi store in New York or a Citibank branch in um, uh, in Summit uh, on Oxford Street, then that comes into comes into play. That I'm, I want to search for Google Business uh, messages. And I, the consumer doesn't even know it's Google business messages. Consumer just sees the messages uh, button there. Uh, RCS model includes A2P as well as P2A. It's a much broader model that requires a much broader search. Uh, I look upon chatbots on RCS kind of a similar way 10 years or 15 years ago, we looked at apps on the app store, right? Consumers, consumers go and search for apps on the app store, but the brand who puts that app also markets that app, also provides links on their website, also pays for advertising for this. When the app store first launched, you could just put your app on the app store and there were like hundreds of the apps or thousands of the apps, so it was easy, easy to discover. And even today when I put an app, it gets millions of impressions organically. Um, so that so the the bot store or the directory of a bots or you can call it a chatbot directory a bot store it would plays a very important role in kind of collecting somewhere where people say I go to look for for bots. Uh, the Google business messaging and the Apple business chat provide a very important function. In, okay, I'm looking for a particular store. I'm looking for a particular business. Now I I can call them. It's like a phone directory or I have a, I have a message directory within that. I'm actually very bullish about the about the Google business messages because I think it provides a model and a path uh, or maybe an excuse, whatever one wants to use for Apple also to say, uh, let me support, uh, I, they, they can coexist. ABC can coexist with an, with an RCS model. Okay, well, we, we're, um, we're coming to the end of the chat. There's, there's still, most, I've got a big list of questions that I've got nowhere near. Uh, enough time to ask, but I'm um, quickly. Um, one of the great um, uh, advantages of, of P2A is that um, there's more. It generates more analytics, um, and I wonder um, 
Kim Frederick, if you can tell us whether this is something that you're looking at, have you, do you, are you able to scrutinize the conversations and, and the, the data that's generated by uh, the traffic um, to, to make, you know, uh, to draw conclusions about things that you can do in the future and so on, or, is, or are there uh, regulatory things that stop you from doing that? Yeah, so we, we operate in an environment which has both regulatory and, and ethical restrictions. Um, so, you know, we, we are uh, in a space where we believe data ethics by design are really critical to our approach. So we are very much a service, not a data company. Um, so uh, we um, do use uh, uh, user data to improve the service. Um, and uh, we can draw some general conclusions at an aggregate level. Um, but I think, you know, for us, I think the really important thing is to understand uh, consumer preferences. We believe very strongly that we need to be where the users are. Rather than trying to get them to come to us, we want to go to them. And so watching trends within the messaging space is really critical to our business. We're not trying to be early adopters, but we're trying to be fast followers. So I think that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be part of this panel just because of what I'm learning as well. And, and I think that there's a lot of businesses like us that are, um, it, it, you know, I think, I think Bolo was saying earlier, this sort of wait and see attitude. Uh, I, to some degree, I think that's happening. And the question is, where are the consumers going to be? And we'll meet them there. Uh, and I think that's for us, um, you know, when it comes to analyzing user data, that is really critical. Simple things like which channels are they choosing, which varies by market, it varies by age, uh, it varies by, you know, so many different factors. We need to understand how our consumer preference is evolving so that we can deliver the service where people are. Okay, well, well speaking of data, we've got some results in from our poll and... Um... We asked people where they would discover chatbots, and 47% said uh, on uh, it depends on the situation. 29% uh, from a directory chatbot, 26% from the web, and 24% from when it's built into certain clients. So it's a pretty even spread, really. It's quite interesting. Um, Gavin, what what do you think? Uh, are you is that uh, what you would have expected that uh, people are kind of happy to equally to to discover uh, bots in multiple different well, I, I think it's early days. I think it's early days yet, but I think it's natural that people would first look, you know, at the directory within the, the endpoint that they're using. If they're using an RCS endpoint, they would expect to find a directory of, of, um, of chatbots within that place. That's a, the natural place to start. Um, even in the case of Japan, they have a, within the endpoint, within the app, there is a, a bot store. So of course people will go and look in that bot store and that'll be their for the first point for discovery. What do you think in the panel? Because you, uh, you had the idea to uh, launch this poll. So how do the results compare to what you thought? Uh, I think it's, it's, it's very revealing. It's uh, not necessarily what I expected because there's been a lot of common wisdom in the, in the industry that uh, for RCS, quote unquote, the only way to offer a directory is to Integrate, integrate with clients like Samsung that already support the built-in search or to uh, sort of get, uh, and that the fact that Google does not have a built-in search is a big disadvantage. But what this poll is showing is from people's behavior and uh, not, model of the fact that this audience is like, I, I think not probably reflective of the common consumer out there, but to the extent they are, uh, they are kind of saying, well, Searching from the web is also equally important. And if you can have a directory chatbot that, that I can search from inside the bot, that's also equally equally important. Uh, because almost like 29, 26, 24, that's uh, almost the same yeah. for, all, for all three of them. Uh, it's very revealing in my mind. I think uh, uh, provides the appropriate focus into other modes of searching in addition to the fact that, uh, of course, if a, if a client supports it, you you support the built-in search, but getting a directory chatbot will also be equally equally important as for this. Okay, well, thank you, Indipal. Um, we've, um, I think we've just about come to the end of our session, and um, if my list of questions is anything to go by, we've barely scratched the surface. So uh, we could talk about this uh, for many more hours, but I would urge everyone watching to download the white paper, 
uh, in the panel. When did you say the white paper was going live? It will be available next week. And, next week. Uh, in the next week, yeah. We were actually hoping to get it out, but we got some delayed in some approvals and um, some final edits, but it will be out by next week. Well, I've seen a working copy of it and it's it's full of great information. So I would urge everybody uh, to keep their eyes out and to download that as soon as it becomes available. And with that, I'll uh, thank our panelists today, Indapal, Kim Frederick, Reshma, uh, Gavin and Bola. Um, and uh, once again, thanks for watching. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference and goodbye. Okay, well, bye -bye. Thanks.